Hola, you amazing artist. This video is actually taken from a Patreon live stream. We do an exclusive Patreon. We actually do two exclusive Patreon live streams every month. And this is from one of them where we answer a question about pricing your artwork. And the conversation was so good that I want to share it with you guys uh, here on the main YouTube channel. So enjoy. Exclusive content. Hola, you amazing rogues. Hello, everyone. We already have a few questions that you guys left us. Rhonda, hi. Hi, Rhonda. Actually, Rhonda, yours is the first question that we will be responding to yes. on the live stream. Yes, it is. Did Is there anything that you wanted to announce before we get started on questions? I guess if I were to announce anything, I would say that uh, make sure that you do not delete your access to your own Facebook page as an admin like I did, because then that means that your Facebook page, you have no access to it. It's just floating out there in the ether. Can I, can I claim the admin and then just let you back in? I don't know. Maybe we'll try, maybe we'll try that immediately yeah. following this live stream. Yeah, maybe we'll try that and see. <laughs> or or some random person out there is going to claim admin on my page and then they're going to become Rafi was here. Then what happens to you? Do you just wink out of existence? I do. I do. Does all that sudden, human I just all of a sudden show up here in the studio? <laughs> yes. If they do, they're going to have a fight on their hands. <laughs> I'm just saying. Megan. Alan said, Hi, Megan. Ellen said, bummer. It's the only way to get access, unfortunately, is to contact Facebook and wait for them to contact you back. So we'll see what happens. Ev says it's Ev. Ha -ha. It took me a second, Ev. <laughs> a split second. All right. So let's get started on the question. Uh, that's it. Yeah. My my big news is like, I lost access to my Facebook page. More updates to follow as yep. customer service eventually gets back to Rafi on how to restore his own access. Well, at least if any of you accidentally um, delete your uh, admin access to your Facebook page, I'll be able to tell you what to do. Yeah. It's a learning Hi, experience. Hey, Cruz. Okay, so Rhonda's... Actually, all these questions are super good. Rhonda's question... I can't remember which video you mentioned this, but you said in a future video you would address how to charge for sculptures. I'd really love to hear your views on this. I'm a soapstone carver. Sculptures 50 pounds or less. And I really am unsure as how to charge. How do you set a reasonable price? Okay. That's that's a really, really good question. Mm -hmm. Pricing sculptures. This, Rhonda, is an interesting question because I've priced sculptures before and I actually have never thought of them as any different than the way that I price my art. And essentially, when you're pricing anything, the things, the three things that you got to consider, and I wrote them down just so I wouldn't forget, is hourly wage, like how much do you pay yourself an hour and how many hours did you spend working on the actual piece? Um, there are a lot of artists out there that are like, it took me 24 hours to create that piece. But they're also counting like the fact that they went to sleep and, you know. <laughs> there are also artists out there that are like, I spent five days working on this and I'm like, what's the price? And they're like, $24. And I'm like, that doesn't yeah, add up. Yeah. So, so it's hourly rate wage is how many hours did you actually spend working on the piece and be fair to yourself, like be fair to yourself. I would say that uh, even starting out, what would you say? What what did you start out with? Uh, I started off at $11 an hour because that was what I was getting paid at the last job I worked back in 2009. <laughs> I got started with $20 an hour, you guys. I, I worked my way up to that. $20 an hour is a fair rate for when you're starting out. $15 to $20 an hour for working on a piece. The other thing you want to put in there is the cost of materials, obviously, any of the materials that you got. And like, I understand that sometimes you're going to find materials at a flea market. You're going to find materials at, um, you know, people are going to give you free materials. Or you're going to get them on sale or you're going to get a volume discount for ordering a bunch of them. Yeah. And the thing about it is that when you are calculating the cost of materials, do not calculate the discount into it. Calculate the actual cost of what the materials are. Yeah, I learned that the hard way because if you have to order just like singular materials for one 
one commission and you can't get them on sale and you can't get it at a volume discount, then it, you need to be at the full price. For yeah. I mean, if you're over, if you're ordering a volume discount, then that's great. That's the, the benefit that you get from it. But as far as the materials are concerned, make sure that you are charging them at the price that they are, not, not whatever discount you're getting. Or even if you got it for free, look at the price of what it is and charge that. Because if somebody commissions you to do another one over, you may not be able to get it for free. So always calculate the full price. So cost of materials, whatever you pay yourself per hour, and then overhead. This is the important one. And this is the one that like a lot of websites out there that talk about pricing your art and, and people giving advice, they always miss out on overhead. And overhead is important because you got to calculate overhead um, based on what it is that you are expensing that is not materials, right? Because, yeah, stone, stone is, yeah, stone, stone is, expensive. is expensive. Yeah. So, like, your materials is one thing. You're going to charge full price for the materials. Um, but at the same time, you have to calculate the lighting that you're using. Uh, you have to calculate any tools that, that use electricity. You got to calculate the fact that during that time you are using the studio or whatever it is. So like, for example, for potters, if they use a kiln, they have to calculate extra overhead that goes into using the kiln, letting the kiln sit there. Yeah. If you're using water, util any utilities, any using. utilities. So you do have to calculate overhead. And so the way that you do that is, um, for each thing, I would say do it differently, but an average overhead is if you take your bills, your, 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 your bills and whatever materials, tools that you need to replace, like sandpaper and things like that, and you do an average of what the cost is and then break it down to your hourly rate, then you can add that onto your hourly rate or just add a bulk price to whatever whatever it is that you're working on. Yeah, and you were saying earlier, it's it could vary from medium to medium. Like, for example, needle felting for me has less overhead than if I have to, like, work on a complicated piece of jewelry that utilizes all kinds of tools and propane and oxygen tanks and saws and all that. Yeah, because, like, with, with jewelry, you've got saws that break, and you have to replace those saws. You have oxygen tanks and gas tanks that need to be replaced. The polishing machine, yeah. All of that, the wheels on the polishing machine degrade over time. So, like, all of that you have to calculate into overhead. Now, don't get stressed out about it. Just do, like, an overall calculation, and as you go, you'll learn – more about like, oh, I should be charging a little bit more for this, or maybe I should charge less for this. Whatever it is, just figure out something for your overhead. Uh, figure out what's your hourly rate that you want to be at. That's usually what ends up going up. Like the more uh, popular your pieces become and the more demand that your pieces have, the more your time is going to uh, cost money. That's basically how my pricing got up. I think I'm at like 50 Anywhere between fifty to seventy-five dollars an hour, but that's only because the demand on my pieces went up. So, uh, and I actually dragged butt to raise my prices because I was afraid to raise my prices. And it wasn't until like it just got too overwhelming where I was getting a lot of commissions or a lot of people buying stuff that like I would raise my prices to try and deter people from buying stuff, which it did not. We got a hello from Dana. Hey, Dana. Hi, Dana. Hello from Kelly. Hi from Thomas. Hey, Thomas. Uh, Michelle Tom. saying hi to everybody. And Kelly said, but you're more apt to stick yourself. Well, yep. needle felting yep. is high risk. It yes. is high risk. So you should charge more. <laughs> For band -aid. Maybe we should add not only hourly wage, uh, cost of materials, overhead, and... Uh, hazard pay? Hazard pay. I mean, I seriously like for for people that do sculptures and they do like uh uh what is that bronze sculptures and stuff. Like, oh yeah, I would definitely charge in the overhead or in the the hourly rate. I would charge some kind of hazard pay. Some stuff is dangerous. It's just dangerous to work on. We're artists. Things. What we do is dangerous. There are some paints that are dangerous. There's you work... a lot of what I work with is dangerous. Yeah. I try to find the least dangerous alternatives to the things, but. It's unavoidable. One of the other things, Rhonda, too, is to take a look at what your market is. So, like, are you selling locally? Are you selling uh, internationally? Whatever your market is and take a look at what 
people around your area, if you're selling around your area, what they're pricing it at. Now, here's the thing. Don't do not do the thing where you compare yourself because their prices may be across the board. Just make sure that you're not pricing yourself out of your market and that you're not pricing yourself under your market. So just kind of find a balance that you're comfortable with. When it comes to pricing, the most important thing is that you are like be comfortable with it make it a little bit higher than you're comfortable with but not where you want to barf every time you have to tell someone a price yeah exactly (laughs) maybe just a little bit (laughs) the way that i price my pieces is that because if you look at my website some people will say that my art is priced very low some people say that my art is priced very high now me when i look at my art um, anytime that somebody asks me for the price deep down inside, I feel like they are getting an amazing deal because my price, my prices are not that expensive. So that is the body language that comes out for me. Now, when I first started, there were some things where I was trying to price it higher. And so like the, the micro expressions and body language that comes out is like, so yeah, when they're like, "Well, how much is the piece?" It's like, "It's uh it's it's $400." You know, it's almost <laughs> like there's this nerve behind it. So like make sure that you're comfortable with it, but just price it a little bit more, just a little bit more than what you're comfortable with until you get comfortable with that price. I think and you can d- disagree or agree with me, but what we're talking about here is pricing structure if you're selling directly to customers not if you're going through a gallery or a shop or anything like that then you're going to need to figure out wholesale versus retail pricing yeah and if you're doing that uh this formula is like your wholesale price yeah the moment selling through a gallery especially one that's taking half then you take that figure and double it. <laughs> so, so here's one of the things that a lot of a lot of people don't know that are not in like the commercial jewelry world, right? So, like for example, jewelry that you buy at Zales or at um, Jerry, yeah, any of those places, <laughs> jewelry there has a markup. The average markup for jewelry is anywhere between three hundred to five hundred percent. That that is no lie. That is no lie. You go to the mall to the jewelry store, you are paying at least three hundred percent of what the the business bought. Now that was back in the day. Right now, when I look at pricing at a lot of these places, what I'm seeing is more along the lines of four hundred to six hundred percent. They are overpricing the jewelry at the mall, at these these very high-end places. It's marked up like five to six times. That is like the business structure. So if you are doing at a gallery, for example, and they are charging you 50% commission, then essentially what they are getting it is at that price that you just figured out here. And then you got to raise your prices to uh, twice as much. So that you can make your original yeah. amount. And that's a standard formula for a lot of mediums is your hourly wage, your cost of materials, your overhead would be your wholesale. You take yeah. that wholesale number and double it. That's your retail. And you're still coming in lower than corporate box store retail. Yeah. Yeah. 300 to 6. Yes. Yes, Michelle. 300 to 6. I mean, I grew up in a jewelry business and so like we had we had a jewelry store and we had very reasonable prices. Here is the one of the most interesting thing about diamonds is that the little dark black coal inclusions that are in the diamond are actually something that scientists crave over because all of those things it's like a pocket of information from billions of years ago trapped within the diamond, right? Mm-hmm. So, geological record stuff yeah so but that just didn't look pretty enough for a lot of people so de beers actually created the the diamond grading system the four c's the four c's so you got clarity you got um cut cut color color carrot weight carrot weight mm-hmm. right so like now, the price of the diamonds are more expensive depending on where they fall on that scale. But the thing is that the scale... It's entirely made up. It's entirely made up. 
by De Beers. And in fact, the rarity, diamonds are not rare. Not at all. They uh, are old. They are old, <laughs> but they are not rare. So like there's a lot of things in the jewelry industry that fall into, in, in any industry, honestly. Because like when you're looking at a, a Jeff Koons, Jeff Koons? Yeah. Not Dean Koons. Yeah, Jeff Koons. <laughs> when you're looking at a Jeff Koons sculpture and they're paying uh, one point. Uh, or $12.5 million for it, it's not because of the materials and it's not even because the artist created it. It has to do with what the reputation is. If enough people agree that something is worth a million dollars, then all of a sudden it is. There's a name for that, and I forget what the name for that phenomenon is. Michelle asked, jewels we can buy in those stores, are they mass-produced or each is crafted like what Klee does? If you're talking no. about big box like Zales they're and ma- Hellsberg, they're mass-produced. They're mass-produced. They're made by machines. Oftentimes humans never even touch them at all. Yeah. Um, there's a precision to that, of course, but, um, now if you're talking about, uh, little boutiques, main street shops, things like that, I freelance for a jewelry store that carries a lot of handcrafted jewelry. The big box places are the ones that are going because they get, because they have more than, they have several locations, then they're able to buy in bulk. So they get an even, even better pricing. And because they're able to buy in bulk, they have to they have to buy mass produced pieces. Now, that's not to say that those pieces weren't designed by somebody, but they're not handcrafted by someone. Yeah, like the Pandora bracelet that is a big hit that that is mass produced, made by machines. Yeah. Yes. So a two dollar item at cost would sell for like fourteen dollars in the big box retail yeah. model. Yes, yes, in some cases that's correct. Now us as artists, because you know, like I'm not, I'm not gonna. I it's one of the reasons that in the video uh, that I put out there about pricing, I say be fair to yourself, but also be fair to the people that are buying for you, uh, from you, because like. You're creating a long-lasting relationship. A lot of these big box stores, there's a reason why they do all this advertising. Um, and I'll give you an example. There's one tattoo place that is in Chicago that does advertising. And the reason they do advertising is because they do horrible tattoos. Mm-hmm. Now, they get plenty of business from advertising, but a lot of the other tattoo shops, they're based on reputation and word of mouth. And so... um my first tattoo that I ever got came from the place that got advertised and then I never went there again. So a lot of these big box stores, they don't care if people go there or not. And with jewelry stores, jewelry is so tricky because people, people get confused about like, even if it break, like they think that they got to go back to the, to the jewelry store that they got it from uh, to get it repaired Right. There's such a misunder. It's even like the first time that you were at the jewelry store and you were looking at the diamonds and you were like, Ooh, look at these diamonds that were like in the sweep. The sweep is like when you sweep the floor because you want to sweep all the gold powder, uh, and save the, the sweep from the jewelry store because you could take that powder and take it to the refinery. And then there's gold in there that that you could get money for. Yeah, which you need to do because gold is $1 billion per ounce these days. <laughs> so while you're doing the sweep, you pick up things like old diamonds and little like uh, ruby cut things or whatever. And Clee, I remember the first time she was in the jewelry store. I was, she was like, like, ooh, <gasps> diamonds. And your dad was like, those are piece of crap diamonds. Those are pieces of crap. Just toss them in here. Uh, okay, so jewelry is the same as the clothing industry. Yes. Yes. Yes, Michelle. Exactly. I figured out that if I add 70% to price I want to get for a painting, when gallery takes 40, I'll get very close to my original asking price. Yeah, that's, a good, that's a good That's a good. Uh, way of doing it. Yeah, come up with your own formula for what lands you at what you're comfortable with. Yeah, you guys, I mean, that's what's important. Like, you're going to, you're, listen, when it comes to pricing artwork or jewelry, for that matter, there is so much advice out there, and it is so... All over the place. Yeah, I uh, all over the place. <laughs> I drove myself crazy looking up formulas for jewelry, um, and I even did it recently with needle felting. And then I was like, "What am I doing? <laughs> I don't need to look this up anymore. I'm just gonna go with what I think is fair." Yeah, but um, I drove myself crazy 
looking at formulas back in the day, yeah. and everyone's got a different opinion. And don't even get me started on pricing for jingles, which I, uh, like a year or so ago, I was looking up pricing for jingles, and I got like a scale that ranged from $50 to $50,000. And I was like, this is nuts. (laughs) So essentially, if you find a formula that kind of sort of works, and then tweak it from there. Find a formula and then make it your own or just make up your own formula. Really, when it comes to pricing your art, remember, and think about it this way, your artwork is something that did not exist before you created it. Uh, It cannot be compared to anything else, even if people try to compare it, because it is originally created by you, by your hands, and there is nothing else out there like it, so you can't do a pricing comparison. You can only price it at whatever you're comfortable pricing it at. Yeah, and whatever you do price it at, people are going to tell you it's too high and it's too low. Rafi, do you charge more for a commission than a piece you already have on hand? How about you, Klee? Um... Cruz, I charge more for a commission if it is something that I know that I'm going to have to, like, put a lot of effort into, a lot of extra effort. Yeah. You know, for example, like, uh, when when I have to do portraiture, because portraiture is so personal to the person, especially if it's uh, portraiture for somebody who is deceased, um, I, I have a difficult time. I want to make sure that it's really, really good. So I want to be able to pay myself to spend that time just focused on that piece and not feel like I'm being taken advantage of. Totally. And that I think that that's one of the reasons, like when you're looking at, if it's something that is a piece of cake for me, then I usually don't, don't charge anything extra. But if it is something that I know that I'm going to struggle back and forth with, um, for example, if you're being asked to do something that you've never attempted to do before, or like you said, something very personal, like a portraiture job, if it deviates slightly from something I already do, then it's no big. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you know you're going to A, have to invest in tools or materials that you don't have, and B, spend a lot of time figuring out, yeah. Uh, then yeah. I mean, I'm still pretty pretty fair, especially if it's uh, one of my collectors already. People that already buy from me, I'm fair. But I always make sure that, I, that I'm that i fair to myself, too, because I know that if it's a piece that's going to stress me out a little bit more, I do not want to get to that place where I'm working on the piece and then I feel like I'm being taken advantage of. Right. Uh, so but you like, also don't want to feel like – I'll give you an example – um, a couple years back, I had an incredibly difficult commission. It took me eons to complete. Um, and if I had been charging for every single hour that I spent on said commission, it would have been ridiculous. Right. So I completed the commission and it took me one billion hours, right? Um, but then I went back and said, but if I had to do it again, here's how long I think it would take me. Uh, knowing what I know now. Right. So you kind of have to strike a balance there too. Yep. But speaking of tattoos, I had someone ask if they could tattoo one of my drawings on himself. Is that weird or cool? I can't. T- Ellen, that is cool. I think it's cool. Yeah. There is uh, actually there's several, but I the the one is Mich- uh, Michelle's. Uh, Oh, the octopus. Yeah. She's got an octopus on her arm, and I did basically what I did because she wanted a, a tattoo. She wanted me to design a tattoo, and I said, listen, I could design a painting that has the darker marks, and you could buy the painting, and then you could do whatever you want with it, uh, tattoo it on your body, and she did, and it's one of the coolest things ever, and I know that I've had other people also. Also, the, the tattoo was where my cousin was like, I want I want a mermaid on a motorcycle, and I'm like, not going to happen, dude. Not going to happen. At least not from this studio. No. We okay, answered that so question. So, Rhonda, did we answer that for you? I mean, I want to make sure that... Or at that least hopefully give some, like... Give you, give you some insight. Jumping off points. Yeah. To kind of work with. Stone is expensive. That's for darn sure. I love, love the, the hoodie. hoodie. Yeah, look! Look! The Rogue Artist! Isn't that cool? It's so awesome. Oh, I'm so excited. I got one, too. 
And I'm not You're wearing not wearing it, it so why are you even talking about mm, it? I can't. Fail. I Fail. Can't Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on pricing. I know that a lot of you uh, have contacted us with questions about pricing your work. And really, when it comes down to it, the best advice I could give, which is the advice that I gave on there, is find a formula that you feel comfortable with and then tweak it and make it your own. Uh, because pricing is all over the board. Everybody has different advice on pricing. So you might as well come up with your way that, that is secure for you as far as like how you price your work and something that you feel comfortable with. Um, cause really you can't get it wrong. It's your work. You're the one pricing it. It, the prices, whatever it is that you decide that it is, it just needs to make sense to you and needs to be fair to you and the people that you're selling it to. That's that's just my opinion. Thank you so much for watching, you guys. You guys are absolutely freaking amazing. I totally adore you. And if you like this and you want to watch more like this, just click right over here to subscribe. And that's it. Adios! Total awesomeness.